with your questions um, and comments. Um, you're welcome to interact with this uh, using the chat um, and to, you're welcome to raise your hand and unmute and to talk. But we've also got a uh, mural, which we'll just show you now. Um, so, and we're gonna put a link to it in the um, chat. So I'm sure lots of you have used Mural or Padlet. Um, it, they all sort of work in a similar way. So we've um, put four questions together here um, as we go through and talk about how we can improve international field research. So the first question is about what is wrong with international field research? What problems maybe you've observed and what needs to change? You're welcome to add um, a comment here. You can either double click uh, with your cursor or on the left hand side, um, there's a little sticky note that you can click on to add your comment. It's already um, starting to be sort of populated here. The second question is about what is holding you back right now. Maybe you've got some challenges, perhaps it's inst institutional challenges or funding. Um, the third one is about training, perhaps about what training you've received um, or what you'd like to receive. And the fourth one, if you've got a success story. Um, we always want to hear about things that are going well and perhaps there's learning um, that can be shared amongst us. Um, so before, before I hand over to Inda, I just wanted to um, talk about how I started um, this journey of um, reading about decolonizing field research and um, things that perhaps need to be changed. Um, I was did my PhD in Brunei um, and it was a couple of years after I did my field research there that I started wondering about some of the practices um, and sort of realizing that I'd never been to a tropical country before and then suddenly I was doing a PhD there. Um, and so I started talking to Mark Griffiths um, who I did my PhD with at King's College London and I had uh, Mark on speed dial um, on my phone and I'd constantly ring him, ask him questions about um, things that happened in the field and you know ways that perhaps practices or methods could be changed and why don't more people from Brunei come to the UK to study, you know, bugs on Dartmoor? Um, and so these conversations were, you know, really flowed and we've written a couple of papers and um, this is the first workshop that we've done. And I really hope that you will join in the discussion after Inda's talk. Um, the talk is going to be recorded, but we're going to stop the recording uh, for the discussion. So it's really a, is a safe place as you know you can ask any question um so feel free to ask question using uh, the chat or um, raise your hand or using the mural um but without further ado i'm going to hand over to inda thank you kate thank you everyone who's joining uh the talk this afternoon as kate introduced me i'm inda i'm indonesian i'm from indonesia and i'm a researcher and also conservationist that has been working in the uh, field of conservation for about four years. So yeah, that's why in this um, opportunity, I would like to share uh, to you my my experience and then how do I feel in the field. That's yeah, based on the perspective of local. Well, some of you might uh, know me, but for uh, everyone who doesn't know me yet, I've prepared a little bit of introductions of who I am and what I do. So I'm currently a master's student in the University of Exeter. I'm doing a uh, conservations and biodiversity master course uh, right now, but previously I used to work in some of the NGOs based in Borneo Island, uh, Kalimantan, Indonesia, as a biodiversity project coordinator focusing on uh, avian uh, survey. And I also helped the University of Exeter for a uh, field course, field work, where the, when they go to the uh, Borneo. And during that time, I also joined the Emerging Wildlife Conservation Leader working on uh, community awareness for Sumatran rhino uh, conservations in Sumatra, Indonesia. And also uh, the decent one, the previous one, I work with the NGO called Borneo Nature Foundations 
best in central Kalimantan in order to protect the orangutan and its own forest. Uh, I would like to show you a little bit of a uh, glimpse of work that I do in the video. I hope you guys can hear it clearly. We are driving to one of our nature reserves that we work in. It's a very beautiful rainforest. It's a treasure of Indonesia. And our main purpose is to protect a family of helmet cornwall. So we, my team, Ricardus and Marega, and Planet Indonesia's Smart Patrol team have been stationed with this nest for the last six months every day. And what the very exciting news about this trip is that we think the chicks will fledge so leave the nest in the next couple of weeks so we brought our communication team members staff to document our trip and to share the magic of helmet at hornbill with you guys and the world before Steph turn off the camera i just want to touch on how we get to our camp because it's in the midst of the rainforest and it's very rural and quite a journey. So right now, we're just like drove five to six hours on the car and soon we will get on the bikes. That's about one or two hours in the rough road and very cool hanging bridge. And after that, we leave our bike in the village just outside the forest and from there we will hike to our camp it's like three hours and after we get to the camp and ta-da we start working right so we just arrived at camp one and it took like three hours to get to this camp and right now we're setting up the hammock for sleep tonight and we are like pretty tired today but we're gonna have dinner soon and we have a couple of american that's gonna help us documenting um what we're doing here as justin and anya so we're gonna have meeting with them after dinner Sedikit, a little bit let's talk Oh, Do you want a little bit of protein? I will eventually. Do you want me to pick one up? Oh, there. Right. So we just arrived at Helmet at Hornbill Nest and we're gonna do bird watching, breeding, and the behavior for 11 hours per day. And uh, we're gonna do this for the next two weeks. And I'm gonna take that spot for bird watching. And and this will take the other one over there, and maybe I'll join with Marega over here. <laughs> For now. Right. So right now we're doing bird watching to see uh, from the Hornbills family over there. So I'm gonna write down every activities, all including like when the time they are pooping or like the males come or any threat with other species of hornbill. We're gonna write it down and just give like descriptions and the times they do that. And the other two take different data sheets. Dan selanjutnya kita melakukan pemantauan feeding dari emetet ambil oke sebelum kita melakukan pemantauan ada data yang kita isi itu nomor nest spesies tanggal lokasi nama pemantau waktu pemantauan terus cuaca sama tutupan awan oke Ketika jantan datang yang dicatat, yang pertama, 
jam masuknya jam berapa terus individu jantan atau betina terus jam feedingnya jam mulai feeding jam akhir dan jam keluar terus dicatat juga pakan apa yang dikasih apakah dia binatang atau pakan buah dan berapa banyak tujuan untuk pengambilan data ini yang pertama sebagai ya menangkap setiap momen di lapangan yang terjadi yang kedua sebagai bukti waktu bahwa kita benar-benar pengambilan data yang ketiga sebagai ya bank data untuk YPI karena kita berhasil melakukan pengamatan rangkong gading seperti itu jadi uh, tujuannya soalnya ya kita pengolahan data untuk sebagai ya tambahan untuk ilmu-ilmu ilmiah kita Kami dari tim Biodif dan di sini kami baru saja selesai melakukan pengamatan sarang burung rangkong gading. Gading. Ya, dan ini adalah pengalaman pertama kami melakukan ini dan ini adalah sarang pertama yang ditemukan di Kalimantan Barat. Ya, betul ya. Jadi yang menemukannya adalah hari Kardus. Mau cerita sedikit tentang bagaimana kamu menemukannya? Ya, cerita sedikit mengenai penemuan sarang rangkong gading itu ya biasa kita sebelumnya pengamatan masuk ke burung jadi ketika waktu santai kita pengamatannya eh, biasanya jadi ketika pada siang harinya kita mendengar ada suara-suara dari orang gading terus eh, saya terpikir untuk mengejar atau mencari suara rangkong tersebut jadi ketika saya naik ke atas terus melihat sekitar kawasan uh, hutan di sini ya jadinya kita dari saya sendiri sangat senang melihat langsung gading betina itu membuat sarang persiapan sarang terus si jantannya bersuara dengan suara ha 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 suara khas dari ya. ya seperti itu jadi ya membuat bangga sekali hmm. mengenai ya kita menemukan sarang tersebut seperti itu mau Ya. Terus setelah kita ketemu sarangnya kita akan kita melakukan penelitian itu selama kurang lebih 6 bulan 6 ya. Bulan, ya. Dan <laughs> itu oh, akan oh, waktu okay. yang lama sekali kami rasa setiap hari kita lalui 11 jam nunggu di sarang ini dan <laughs> dan pada akhirnya burungnya keluar dan terbang dan bebas di alam. Ya, Tapi, itu pengalaman yang membuat kita wah jarang-jarang ya. kita bisa menemukan dari ya. sebagian orang mungkin tidak tidak banyak orang yang bisa menemukan kayak ya, yang dari YPI juga ya. Ya. membuat suatu penemuan baru terutama untuk di Kalimantan Barat. Ya. Semoga untuk kedepannya lebih banyak lagi kita menemukan hal yang seperti ini. Jadi bukan ini yang pertama kali dia dan untuk yang terakhir kalinya diharapkan kedepannya ada lagi untuk data-data selanjutnya. Yeah.
Okay, so that is uh, one of the examples of uh, successful collaborations, research collaborations between uh, local people we are driving to one and and the international um so why international collaborations is essential first it's an opportunity to broaden knowledge and experience in both local and international international people could have um theoretical knowledge about about conversations or or research but the local people uh, would also have more like practical uh, knowledge that be, can be shared in, in in the international that's that's why it works uh, both way the second point collaborations also as an as a platform for share, sharing the resources um, as you can see in the previous video as well, that the local uh, community or local people has their lands here, has the uh, place filled to work with, and the international has their own their um, technology, maybe the the news decent system of educations or or stuff or devices that could be shared with the local uh, people. The third aspect of how important the collaborations is to spread the message and awareness. The real, um, I wouldn't say problem, issues maybe in, in the local community that hasn't really uh, applied the conversations or like doing a real conservations protecting the area is not because they don't care, but it's because they're unaware about what's going on in the world. And that's where the the international people would uh, came and then like bring news, some news to spread the, the message and, and awareness to the, the local people. But it's not just that. The international who came to local area might also unaware about the cultural practices, what um, the local community has been uh, done since in centuries so it is important uh, for both of the uh, groups to to share and and spread message in not not only one side but also both sides the last uh, aspect how important why this is essential is because um, collaborations could build a strong relationship between local and international, so they can um, work together in the future and have like a project together. However, based on my experience uh, working in the field of uh, conservations in Indonesia, some of them are successful. Maybe the, the, the example is as you can see in the video, but some of them is uh, are not because when it comes to the capacity building, who is doing the teaching? I, it's it's still common to find where the researcher or the people, the international international people who came to uh, uh, my area, for example, Borneo, just telling people what to do, and they kind of like teach people how to to make the works done which is which is this thing is not right it has to be um both perspective that works together local local people usually at the late stage in project design i found it really really common because uh local people should be involved in every stage of the project design project like research project design not only like the the latest like the work that have done but also involved in in in, in um, making decisions how how make the works um running and 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 done fully 
the fourth that I usually found is the foreigners assume that they know more. So the presence of the local researchers is unnecessary. I experienced it myself. For example, we ever have like a, a field work when we have to do the bird survey, um, like the biodiversity of the birds in, in certain area and, and the, the foreigner think they know the best about the the birds in that area so they don't feel they the the involvement of the local researcher is is important or essential for their field work which is uh kind of make me questioning like okay what's so what's the point of of uh their work there what is that for and the last is the that I found is the ignorance about the local culture. This it might seem simple, but this is very fundamental, especially for the local community, because we really, really hold on the culture. And and sometimes some like researcher outside of the country come and then um, don't really care about the local practices and then what what the local people do in 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 that area yeah so um the researcher or the international collaborator should value the local culture in the area that they work on they work with so how should we do it first I think it's it's very fundamental and crucial to build trust between not only from local people to international, but also international and local. And this might sound simple, but this is very important and crucial because uh, by having trust that make could make the projects run uh, nicely. And also after building trust, the teamwork when I say teamwork, this is the local people and also the international collaborator, the international people work together from the designing the projects until uh, the designing the project, what's the purpose until get the results together. And the third point um, of how uh we should do the collaborations is to support each other local and international where um the local people support what's like the idea or or the um thought that international people bring but also yeah support each other in in order to to get the benefit and then reach the goal um together by doing all of these uh, three points, I think uh, the local and also the international could, could uh, reach the goal and then done the, the project swiftly rather than working uh, individually by the side. My slide is very quick. But I also uh, have a little example of how the researcher do when, do when they come to Borneo. It's, it's, it's when they visit Borneo, I feel like they kind of like want to be a hero to save the Borneo rainforest, which is, I found it really weird uh, for me because for example i came to uk i don't have thought about changing the or like fixing the the uk biodiversity or do we do rewilding or reforest um replanting the forest in the uk but i reach the expert i would like to uh work together with the expert in the uk in order to reach the same goal the same uh, conservation work that we we it's benefit for all of us. So um, 
my takeaway from takeaway from my talk is for the people international local who wants to help the the local area or local community yes help but just just um remember and think about like what's what's the impact what's the benefit for for your actions what actually you want to reach is this for your own benefit or for the local community or for both all of us and for the environment and people like me exist we are exist the local people who's doing um research research and know about their own area are exist so we are not just a uh, translator we are capable to do work and 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 collaborate so work together with the with the local uh, local people and uh last thing I would say just because you were born from the West doesn't mean you know the best. So that's all from me. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate. Thank you very much. That was fantastic, Inda. Thanks so much. Um, that I'm still feeling the emotion from uh, that film with the hornbills leaving and you're uh, asking so many important questions there um it, yeah brilliant and we've now got half an hour that we can um unpack some of those things that you you've mentioned in the talk there um just ha having a look at the mural uh, we've already had um a few comments from people um and they are you know sort of um echoing some of the things you've just been talking about so talking about how someone's posted about how re um research agenda is being developed in the global north and really uh, research proposals need to be, um, you know, uh, developed together. Um, it shouldn't be ideas from the global north going to the global south. It has to be a collaboration, exactly what you're saying. And the equity of uh, knowledge production. Um, so I, I would like everyone to um, keep asking questions and comments on the mural um, or do um, uh, use the chat. I've got lots of people saying how brilliant that talk was. Um, but first of all, um, before we open up the floor to everyone, I'm just going to ask Heather, um, who's a senior technical advisor at ZSL and um, professor at the University of Exeter, to, to join us here and give um, some feedback on Inda's talk and sort of reflections. Thanks, Kate, and, and, and thanks, Inda. That uh, was a fantastic talk. and. Uh, I guess as a as as a Western researcher, those it, it, it sort of makes you reflect. So, as Kate mentioned, um, I'm at, based at the Zoological Society of London. I've been there for 27 years, and I've been doing involved in international research since 1996. Was when I did my very first field work in Mexico, and sort of reflecting on on that sort of relationship between why did I start doing international research and um, how did I do it? And, and I think over the last um, couple of years, really reflect, reflecting on what I feel very comfortable with and what I feel, you know, could have done better. It's, it's obviously been a time of really sort of thinking through that and um, looking at ways to improve. I think initially I was really, really fortunate in the mentors to me actually came equally from researchers from those countries and from um, internationally. So from the beginning of my experiences of working in a country, it was a, a, a very equitable relationship of the contribution of um, a local researcher in Mexico. It was um, from, from UNAM, the local university. Um, and when I got to the Philippines, which is a, a country I've worked in ever since 1998, um, that was through working with a, a local foundation, the Haribon Foundation, um, which is actually uh, focused on birds as well, but um, I'm a marine biologist and so we were very much focused on that. I was also very privileged early on to work with local communities and to work with teams 
uh, biologists and community organizers, which are essentially social scientists, um, all from the Philippines. So that really set the tone of expertise and, and that was the very early days of community-based conservation. So with no si social science experience at all, that really um, gave me an enormous an, a, a amount to learn. And I think I've always in that way sort of described myself as, as, as a facilitator, bringing that um, perspective and knowledge uh, from elsewhere, some, some of the thinking and methodology, but looking at uh, how to build strong local partnerships. And some early insights were things like, we were doing some reef monitoring work around um, marine protected areas that had been set, off, set up and looked at how they'd recovered. And our data suggested that they were recovering really quite slowly and quite patchily, whereas the local communities felt that they were recovering really well. Now, the first reaction from that is to think, well, um, you know, clearly we're, we're using statistics and science and, you know, we obviously, you know, our, our data is more robust than the local communities. But, but then we, you know, we're having a discussion about that with the communities and, we went twice a year, once in the dry seasons, once in the wet season, and, and we're collecting those data, and, and that's the, the, the team. Whereas the communities live there and interact with the, that patch of ocean all day, every day, um, and often at night as well. So it's just coming from a very different perspective. And I think it is that taking that time to think about that perspective and what it means. And it enabled us to sort of dig in um, a little bit more into understanding those local perspectives. But that's undone if you look at it from a research perspective, um, and there's some really fantastic um, recent papers on this topic that really highlight the issues that we face. Um, first is that, you know, most ecological research is published in the wealthiest countries, but most biodiversity is in the poorer tropical countries. Um, we have 70% of the world's coastlines are in developing countries. And then you look at the actual publications and I, I saw one horrible statistic that 40% of publications with field work in the Philippines and Indonesia had no host nation scientists in, included in that. Um, we are looking at a, a, a from a scientist um, perspective of being driven by very, very narrow metrics of, of publish or perish um, into journals, which are focused on impact factors and English speaking um, with often very undiverse boards and undiverse reviewers that can penalize filters both on names and on, um, uh, on English um, and you know, being very, very intolerant. I think recent conversations are started, starting to see things changing. And I guess I'm a fortunate in my work at ZSL, although I do science, I'm not a formal academic. And so that's not the primary metric driving my work. And so I've been very fortunate to be able to think more about the time it takes to co-create projects, the opportunities for mentorship and how to build long-term meaningful partnerships um, that said, I wouldn't say I've always got it right. Um, and I think thinking about um, as this issue has been become more focused and we realise how imbalanced things are and the challenges and, and you know, people like Inda as very strong uh, national researchers who are highlighting these, these issues and how to do it right, because there are very simple solutions out there and there are huge strengths and valued international collaborations um, is a really you know, important time to reflect on how to move ahead and to do things, to do things well. So I'm, I'm excited to be part of this discussion today. Thanks, Kate. Great, thanks, Alice. Um, thanks very much. And now, um, Mark, would you like to unmute yourself and, and give some reflections? Um, do you wanna give a bit of a background as well? Cause you're, so a proper social scientist here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I might be a bit of an outsider. I, I work at Newcastle University and I, um, I've done work in development in India in the past, but most of my work is in political geography in Palestine and Israel. So um, I've worked on, you know, checkpoints and house, house demolition. So quite a bit away from what 
um, Linda's doing here, but I've been thinking about the ethics of, of doing research on the ground. Um, for instance, I've been interviewing or trying to get the testimonies of women who live in rural areas of the West Bank whose houses uh, um, are threatened with demolition, and it's a really difficult thing to do. And there's a question of even whether I should be leading that kind of work because I'm a white British man and thinking about the histories of Britain in um, in the you know the establishment of Israel and and and, <coughs> and Balfour Declaration, etc. Et so that's where I come from. Um, I, I wanted to respond to Inda's talk with four points, really, because I thought it was really interesting. It made me think about some broader issues, not for you to answer, Inda. Um, I thought it was, it's beautifully sharp. The sound uh, mixing is excellent. And I, do, I also like the way that you mix languages, especially at the end, because not everything should just be in English. Um, so that was great. I wanted to, I was thinking about why do helmeted hornbills matter and who decides what species matter and you know it makes me think of pandas and elephants and koala bears it seems to be sometimes or often indexed on size and cuteness and um what what other species maybe aren't so cute but matter as much um, um to the environment i'm speaking as somebody who doesn't know anything about the physical environment by the way so um and secondly, it made me think about, and your comment at the end about I'm going to save the, the Borneo rainforest is a really good one, because if, you, if somebody like me thinks about saving the Borneo rainforest, where do you go? You go to the Borneo rainforest. But I think about the other sites that matter. So the, the, as I understand it, the hornbill, the, the bird has a, something that can be carved on its head. <laughs> um, there must be supply chains that are really important there. There must be legislation that's really important there. So I was thinking about what site do you go to first to save the forest, so to speak. Um, surely the halls of, you know, lawmakers and lobbyists is also a really important site to visit if we are to save the rainforest or to achieve anything. Um, and then I was thinking about the audience of something like your, of your video and the audience of research more, more, more broadly. Um, are we just speaking to other researchers or are we speaking to people who might be able to affect change in a real way? Um, again, going back to lawmakers. And then the final point that I have is um, one that probably Kate's going to roll her, her eyes at, but um, why are the tropics interesting? Why is everybody so obsessed with the tropics? And I know the answer is there's more biodiversity in the tropics, but like Kate also mentioned at the beginning, isn't Dartmoor also very interesting? Well, Northumberland is probably more interesting, but there's also Dartmoor. And we, I, we were interviewing quite recently, um, a, I think he's an ecologist from Brazil, he's Brazilian, and he said, rainforests are boring, because he grew up around the rainforest, and he finds the sort of temperate forests of, of the UK, for example, much more interesting. So there's that, it might be that the biodiversity is important, but there's also that exoticness, like the otherness that people really want to pursue. Um, and I have to say, I have to admit that's also true here for, 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 some, for somebody like me, that it's part, part of it is the travel and meeting different people and just being in a different place. So it made me think about those four things that I'm not asking you to respond to, but they speak to wider issues on field work. Right, thanks, Mark. Um, Indra or Heather, do you want to respond to anything that Mark said then before we open up the floor? Yeah, thank you so much. That's that's very interesting and very good questions, Mark. I'll try to answer the the first one. Why why helmet harm this matter? Well, um, I would say according to the the data and also based on the. Um, morphology, ecology of this species, that helmeted hornbill is, it's, we call it the farmer of the forest. Uh, their, their, their main um, food diet is ficus, where it's hard for the ficus itself to spread the seed. While ficus, ficus tree is the um, key species like of of the rainforest because the ficus also food for, for other animals, pigs, 
uh, deers and and other 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 uh, species of animal. But the problem with the ficus is it's hard for them to spread. So we need the helmet hornbill or also the other type of hornbill to help them spread the seeds throughout the rainforest, especially in the deep the highland forest of um, Borneo, the deep forest. But it, how much the hornbill is it's highly threatened right now because of the wildlife um, trade. They, they try to hunt their cask, it's called cask, like a tusk in elephant, for, for ornament, or ornaments or like for uh, accessories or medicines. So they are highly um, threatened that caused them critically endangered in, in the wild. And because of uh, still lack of data currently, we can't, we still don't know like the exact number of the helmet hornbills in the wild right now. We just have the est estimations, which is like very, very uh, less now for them in the wild. And also the uh, a lot of threats, not just the wildlife uh, threat, a uh, trait, but also like the uh, uh, forestations and uh, land changing, and also a big, big problem for them. And also because they choose a specific type of tree to make the nest for the breeding, they need specific, um, like a swollen tree that has hole to, because their head is very heavy. That's why they need specific type of tree and that type of tree now is like um, like in in is very valuable for the illegal logging so that's also the main threat for them for, uh, main threat for for their species and the audience for for the video it was made with by the organizations that I work is a non non government organizations and we made it in in uh, both language Indonesians and English it's for the people in Indonesia and also we try to make it for for the governments also to reach out the international uh, people about how important these these species for the rainforest so it's kind of like try to uh, reach certain level of, of, of audience here. And um, that, that's great, Inda. Yeah. I'm, I'm just keeping um, an eye on time. Should we open up the floor to everybody else? We're going to stop recording now. Um, so it's a free discussion um, 